Well, he's been a bit of a back and forth on um, issues related to China. So I, I don't think he's taken it to much of a new level uh, as, as much as a sort of more confused level. Um, you know, as, as, as candidate Trump, uh, as president-elect Trump, he had some very, very strong and quite controversial things to say about China, uh, including, for example, slapping a 45% tariff on Chinese imports, declaring China a currency manipulator, which would trigger a number of economic uh, punishments, and maybe most controversially, uh, speaking with the president of Taiwan by telephone uh, in December. All of this uh, threw into real question what sort of U.S.-China relationship there might be. He even went so far as to question the validity of the long-standing one-China policy. Um, but upon entering office, all of this has been walked back quite remarkably, uh, even to the extent of the president inviting very early on in his time in office the Chinese president to spend 24 hours with, with the President Trump at the uh, Mar-a-Lago estate. And coming out of that summit, you know, relatively positive feelings, it seems, uh, about the future for U.S.-China relations. So uh, we're still too early to know which direction uh, this president may ultimately take the relationship, even though it's currently in a relatively positive place. So uh, President Xi Jinping uh, traveled to the Mar-a-Lago estate in Florida, uh, the private sort of club of President Trump, the so-called Southern White House, spent about 24 hours there. And this meeting was long on ceremony and short on substance. Uh, it was really a sort of get to know you type of affair. The two presidents apparently did spend a considerable amount of time speaking with one another, something like five or six hours worth of conversation. Um, we don't know a lot in, with much precision about what was discussed, um, but uh, the, the early reporting coming out of it suggests that the, um, the, the trade deficit that the United States has with, with, with China, as well as the challenge of North Korea, were probably the two biggest things discussed, and subsequent tweets by the president and some public statements since the summit suggest that he's looking to link those two um, issues in the U.S.-China relationship, that apparently he may be prepared to be less uh, punitive um, with China on the trade question if he believes that China is doing what he thinks it should to bring greater pressure to bear on North Korea. So at the moment, those seem to be the two biggest issues that might have some near-term results coming out of the summit. Well, I think there's a, 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 a mixed feeling, I would say, uh, amongst allies in the region um, with regard to President Trump's approach towards China. A part of that is simply the, the unpredictability, the volatility, the flip-flopping that's taken place over just the last three to four months uh, with regard to China. I think allied capitals uh, have good reason to be concerned that they just don't know. We cannot be sure which direction President Trump is going to be taking the relationship over the next three to four months, and especially if a real crisis were to erupt, for example, on the Korean Peninsula. Um, now, a little bit less strategically, though, I think um, some of the Allied capitals are worried that the president might strike some sort of a deal over their heads. And I think that's a particular concern to countries like Japan or South Korea, um, that President Trump will come to some sort of understanding with China, uh, or uh, more, more dramatically, uh, might uh, launch some sort of attack towards North Korea um, uh, on the understanding that the Chinese would not uh, overreact. But of course, that would be extremely dangerous uh, for Seoul and, and probably for Tokyo. With regard to Australia, I think obviously um, the early days of the of the Trump administration have not been all that uh, pleasant, especially because of the um, now notorious telephone call between the Prime Minister and the President. With regard to China policy, um, it I think there must be some worries in Canberra uh, that if and as the President does take a more combative approach toward China. Uh, if, he, if, he, if he does choose to live up to some of the uh, threats he made on the economic front or even with regard to South China Sea, 
um, that Australia might be drawn into that uh, into that sort of maelstrom, which wouldn't be good at all for Canberra, who wants to have a more balanced relationship between these two great powers. Well, we don't know yet, but I think probably that's uh, we can be relatively assured that the, uh, the two sides are going to continue along the pathway of their current understandings uh, and not let that uh, issue set devolve into something more confrontational. Why is that? Well, first of all, China has pretty much created facts on the ground uh, in terms of uh, rebuilding the islands there and militarizing them that are going to be very, very difficult for anyone, including the United States, to change or dislodge. Uh, and to do so, if the United States chose to do, would probably mean war. And I don't think that that's something Washington is really prepared to do. Um, Washington's interest is to be able to continue to assure freedom of navigation, both commercial and obviously importantly military related shipping in accordance with international law. Now that's an issue that China I think is unlikely to try and push back hard on. They will complain, uh, they will um, you know, deploy military assets uh, if, if they think they need to to try and um, uh, deter or try and keep uh, American intelligence operations from getting too close or, or following uh, developments too, too sharply. But I don't think they would do so in a way that would lead to a conflict between the two. There's always the potential of an inadvertent clash of some kind, um, but the two governments actually have protocols in place to try and avoid precisely that problem. So I, I think in the near to medium term, South China Sea, at least as it affects U.S.-China relations, is unlikely uh, to devolve into anything uh, looking like a conflict.